we are going to uh, bring in as a help and a teacher Saint Isaac of Nineveh to help us um, get a better idea of the mystery of the will of our human of our will our um, the, the, the overarching uh, topic of these lessons um, that were that are springboarding from the epistle to the Ephesians um, we've suggested is the healing of the will the healing of the will um, maybe it would be useful just real quickly to uh, do a real quick review from last week um, in the epistle to the Ephesians we have the um, we have this from St. Paul where he says in chapter 2 verse 1 you were dead in your sins and trespasses and you were walking in them and he talks about the energy of the ruler of the power of the air that is working in the children the sons of disobedience so there is an energy in the death that sin causes um, it is an energy of death it is an energy that works decay and disintegration um, and our hearts in our heart at the very core of our being we were dead in our sins and trespasses and this work this energy of death of decay and disintegration was working in us was this is before our baptism um, but even so um, if we don't um, if we don't give ourselves consciously intentionally willfully um, to the other energy that St. Paul speaks of, then that energy of death continues to work in us. It comes back, continues to work in us. Now that other energy can be given, uh, is found um, in, uh, for example, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, uh, that you might come to know the surpassing greatness of his power in us who believe. Um, and, then, and then it goes on, uh, according to the energy of the might of his strength, well, that is a phrase, I believe, that's modifying the surpassing greatness of his power. It's not, surpass, it's not modifying uh, the, 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 to believe. So uh, those of us, who, those who believe, um, they are the ones um, that enter into and begin um, living in this energy of Christ's resurrection. And that is the energy that begins to work in the heart. And then in chapter 3, <clears throat> verse 16, St. Paul writes that he might give to you, according to the wealth of his glory, in power, that you may be made strong through his faith in the inner man. Um, and that you might be, that, that, um, that Christ might, be, might dwell in, in your hearts through faith, and that you are, so that you are rooted and grounded in love. So the um, picture drawn for us here is that uh, through, through the mysteries of the church, the sacraments of baptism, Holy Chrismation, um, Confession, um, Holy Eucharist, um, in which we don't just don't just believe in Jesus, we actually receive him. Uh, we're touched by him, we're, we're washed by him, we're clothed by him. And finally, we actually eat and drink him. Um, and he becomes members, he, be, he joins himself to, our, to us bodily, psychologically, mentally. And so through the sacraments of the church, Christ um, is received in us. Um, and with Christ, there is received in us, you know, all the way down into the heart where we were dead and where death was working, this energy of Christ is received all the way down into the heart. So now there is working in our heart that was dead, there is working the energy of Christ's resurrection. And here in chapter 3, verse 16, he's praying that, that you know, that, that we might, that, that Christ may dwell in us. Through faith, he says. But here that doesn't mean just by believing, in the way that we think of believing. Uh, but he might dwell in our hearts through faith. That means through an intentioned, um, conscious, uh, willful, um, um, you know, um, uh, repentance. Always, 
always returning in our heart, always directing ourselves towards this energy uh, of Christ's holy resurrection that has now been sown in our heart. And that by that, that through that, through our, our, our participation, our receiving Christ and our willful um, um, exercise and practice of denying ourselves for the sake of Christ and of losing our life for the sake of Christ and his holy gospel, that his love is what will become rooted in us. Whereas death was rooted in us before and the darkness of the ruler of this, air, of the, of this age, that it would be the love of Christ uh, and his holy resurrection now that are rooted in us and become more and more of, um, established in us. Okay, so that's the picture that we get, that is drawn for us in, um, in, in the, the epistle to the Ephesians. So at this point, we're going to bring in St. Isaac of Nineveh. Uh, your worksheet in front of you. And uh, we have some, uh, some notes about St. Isaac, just to uh, give you a sense of uh, who he is and orient you to him. Uh, he, lived, uh, he lived in uh, you know, the east, Persia, Nineveh. Um, the Sir he's, he belongs to the Syriac uh, Christian tradition, um, along with St. Ephraim of Syria, uh, St. Romanus the Melodist, um, St. Dionysius the Areopagite, or the, you know, that's, what he's, that's the name he goes by, who was writing in the uh, 500s. Um, he is also in the, in the Syriac tradition. Who else? The Liber Gradium, the Book of Steps uh, that we were studying this last summer that also is from the Syriac Christian tradition. Um, he lived close, he, he was a contemporary of St. Maximus the Confessor, as you can see, who died in 6, I say 668. I think he died in 662. Anyway, he died in that area, in that time frame. And then also the, ex the Sixth Ecumenical Council was taking place in 681. The Sixth Ecumenical Council was that council that condemned the heresy of monothelitism and monoenergism. The heresy that teaches that Jesus Christ um, had only one will. And that was the divine will. And that if he had a human will at all, it was... Um, absorbed and taken up into his divine will. Um, Monothelitism, monoenergism are at the, uh, these heresies are the, uh, the seed of what we have come to know in the West as the doctrine of predestination, Calvin's doctrine of predestination. Uh, that is just another form of monothelitism and monoenergism. Now these, uh, these are the, these are two paragraphs are taken from the very first homily of St. Isaac of Nineveh. And as you read them, you might find yourself yawning. Ho oh, hum, okay. So, uh, this, by the way, is the book of St. Isaac's homilies. So, this is not a book that you're going to carry around with you when you're traveling on the train or on the plane, so it stays home. Um, and this is the first homily. And what I'd like us to do, what I intend to do, is to um, think about it, parse it out. If I can find my notes that will help me, remind me. Um, let's let's read this and let's give it a real close thinking and see if we can discover what's hiding in these the words of Saint, this homily of St. Isaac. This is the kind of homily, I suppose, that if St. Isaac were to preach it to us this morning, we'd probably be sitting back in the pew and just going, hmm, okay, another sermon, until you start thinking about it. And then you realize that there's a whole lot here. So let's read the first, the first one, first paragraph. The fear of God is the beginning of virtue or wisdom, and it is said to be the offspring of faith. It is sown in the heart when a man withdraws his mind from the world's distractions so as to confine its wandering thoughts 
within the ruminations of reflection upon the restitution to come. All right. He gives um, three main things. I don't know what to call them. He gives, there's like three main things he's talking about, and they're, 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 he does, he, there's a sequence that they have, and I think it'd be useful for us first to identify the three main things that he's talking about in section one, and then to give the sequence in which they happen. Can you identify the, first, the three things he's talking about? Name one. Fear. The fear of God is one. Wisdom. Yep, okay, so we got fear of God. And we have, I'm saying wisdom because, uh, you know, the fear of, he's probably drawing from Proverbs, you know, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Um, but also St. John, uh, the fear of God is, it, it grows into the love of God. Uh, but Christ is the wisdom of God. So virtue, wisdom, maybe even love of wisdom. You know, it might be useful if we knew the Syriac. Because in the Latin, virtue means strength, right? So it would be the strength of goodness. Be strong in goodness. Okay, what's the third thing that you see? Faith. Faith. Now, look at those three things. And let's see if we can identify the, if we can trace out, track out the, the, the sequence. What comes first? Fear of God. Explain yourself. No, no, the other way around. No, you're right. I'm sorry. You're right. Yes. All right. You see what she's saying? So the first thing, the root of this all, would be faith. And the offspring of faith, right, is the fear of God. And the offspring of the fear of God is virtue. So there's the ladder. There's the sequence. Now, <clears throat> so then what is the it that is sown in the heart when a man withdraws his mind? What would you say? What's the main subject of this whole paragraph? The fear of God. The fear of God. So the it, the antecedent of it, like the, the antecedent of the it before it, when it says it is said to be the offspring of faith, we're talking about the fear of God. The antecedent is the fear of God. So the fear of God is sown in the heart. Now, here's the question. Um, he now proceeds to describe the activity or the action that takes that is that ha that that you know that one does in order to sow in one's heart the fear of God. Um, um, well, well, let's look at it. It is sown in the heart when a man withdraws his mind from the world's distraction so as to confine its wandering thoughts within the ruminations of, or, of reflection or in, within, <laughs> within contemplation upon the restitution that is to come. Um, do you s so we have these three main terms. The first is faith. The second is the fear of God. The third is virtue. They all, un uh, they all develop out of the other. The fear of God is the offspring of faith. Okay, so, does that give you a clue as to what he's talking about in the second sentence? I mean, is it possible that he's talking about one of these three terms in the second sentence? Is it possible that the second sentence is in parallel to one of those three terms? 
What do you see, Sonia? Exactly. That's what I see. Because he's saying it is sown in the heart. What, the fear of God is sown in the heart when a man withdraws his mind from the world's distraction so as to confine its wandering thoughts within the ruminations of reflection upon the restitution to come. So this is the activity. This is faith. This is what faith looks like. This is how faith is done. So that's what I mean. Faith isn't just, oh, I believe. Faith is an action. It's a movement. It's a work. It is sown in the heart with the man when a man withdraws his mind from the world's distraction so as to confine his wandering thoughts within. Now, let's break this down. Let's put it into English. So, you know, within the ruminations of reflection upon the restitution to come. Put that in English. What is he talk, what is, what's a better way to say that? So that we can understand what he's talking about. Yes, this, the restitution to come would be the second coming. What else do we call it? Judgment. The judgment to come. And, and I think we need to say judgment. Because this will help us as we start to unpack it. So, it, 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 when it, so as to confine its wandering thoughts... What's a better word for a better, yeah, what's a better way to say ruminations or reflection or a more accessible way? Meditation. Meditation. Uh, pondering. Yeah. Yeah. Um, contemplation. Um, now, when it said it is sown in the heart, when a man withdraws his mind, from the world's distractions so as to confine its wandering thoughts within the, within the meditation, the pondering, the contemplation of the judgment to come. I think it might be useful at this point, real quickly, it uh, might be useful real quickly to point out the uh, I see this as the um, V of the ABCs of Orthodox spirituality. So let's put out the B just real quick. I'm going to come back to the B in the catechumenate class, and I'm uh, working with other with the teens also on the ABCs of Orthodox spirituality. The the B has to do with the the map of the human being, and we've already covered this. I've already said this before you. And in this map, you've got the body. And then you have the inner man, the soul. But the soul itself can be um, distinguished into three main parts. You've got the desiring part. You've got the feeling part. You've got the thinking part. I didn't draw this big enough. So you have these three parts of the soul. The desiring, you know, yearning, um, eros, um, erotic love, um, feeling, um, emotions, anger, joy, sadness, um, elation, um, thinking. Uh, that is the, um, the mind, what we associate with the mind. Um, but then inside all of these, and to be distinguished from them, is what's called the heart. So the heart is the inmost sanctuary of the human being, the human composite. So when he says, um, when he says, withdraws his mind, um, at this point, um, he could well be talking about the thinking part of the soul. Because sometimes that's called the mind or the rational faculty. Uh, but it gets to be a bit confusing. Because the heart, which as you know, that, that is the person. That's our deep self. The heart also has a faculty peculiar to it. Um, which is called 
uh, spirit, or in the nous in Greek, which means which is translated as intellect. Um, and any any uh, thing you any literature you read from the Orthodox, um, when they first set this word out, you know, in the translation of whatever it is there, whoever it is they're translating, there will always be a note that this intellect that we're calling intellect is in Greek the nous. And it is not to be confused with the brain, or you know, with 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 the thinking faculty of the mind. This this transcends psychology. We're not we're not in psychology anymore, Toto. Um, it's the end. It's 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 so the, it's it's called spirit, or it's called the noose, and it is the contemplative faculty of the heart. So the soul has a thinking faculty. And we exercise and cultivate that thinking faculty of the soul, what we call the brain or the mind, you know, by learning geometry, uh, music theory, um, the different sciences, you know, um, this is how we develop the mind. This is what's developing in us as we grow older, as, as, as Jack is getting older. It's his mind that's being developed, his, of his soul. But, um, a, a, but the mind... Um, you know, we associate knowledge with the mind, of the, with the thinking part of the soul. But think about it. How, does the, how do we gain knowledge with the thinking part of our soul? How do we gain knowledge? We gain knowledge by what? By, by logical thinking, you know, deduction, induction. Um, major syllogism, major, major premise, Minor premise, therefore, the conclusion. Uh, we gain knowledge through experimentation, um, formulating hypotheses, and then testing them out. Um, so that the knowledge gained by this mind part of us is gained by observation, is gained by, by measurement, and it's always the knowledge of something that's out there. And it's always, I mean, at its heart, honestly, it is really but guesswork. It's really a guess. Um, it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's observation. This is what we see. Um, this is what we experience. Therefore, we deduce that this might be a possible cause or reason for why this is the way it is. So it's different from the knowledge of the noose, the intellect or the spirit. This is the part deep in our heart that um, is, that is, um, it's of the heart. The heart is deep beyond all things. So if this is the faculty of the heart, the contemplative faculty of the heart, it follows that it is in our intellect or our noose, our spirit, in which we are, we have the capacity to contemplate God directly. And to know God, not through the mediation, you know, of dialectic or discursive reasoning, but to know God immediately, directly, by becoming one with him in the secret heart, the chamber of the heart. So this is the faculty that has the capacity even to see God, to see the invisible. And this faculty is not cultivated, it is not exercised by mathematics, music theory. This faculty is contemplated or is developed by faith, which is what St. Isaac is describing here in the first paragraph. It is sown in the heart. The fear of God is sown in the heart. When a, what we you know Okay, just think about this. Um, if you can imagine, if you haven't actually experienced, if you can imagine, um, what would you have to experience within yourself in order to begin really to fear God? Knowledge of God. What do you mean, knowledge of God? Because we just talked about two kinds of knowledge. 
the discursive or the dialectical, and the immediate. So what do you mean? We're now very deep, so we've got to start explaining ourselves. What do you mean? To know who's there, too. Okay. You're, str you're struggling for words, it sounds like. But also, as you experience him, you, you instinctively understand his holiness. Understand Could we say, um, <clears throat> you have to feel God. Yeah, but more, more, and actually, you know, um, there's, a, there's a word that you find the Father's using that is often translated as awareness or consciousness, but it's not, it's, it's the word from which we get aesthetic. So it's, it's, it's an awareness, it's a consciousness that comes from, you know, touch, sensory. So, um, I mean, there's a, you know, so that you have to feel God in your, in, in your inner parks, in the same way that if I were to touch you, you'd feel my finger. I could even feel, touch you on your back, and you can't see my finger or my hand, but you can feel it, and so you know it's there. You're not just imagining it. Um, you're not just guessing. You're not, it's not like a conclusion to a, to a, to a syllogism. A, a premise, B premise, therefore God must be there. You know he's there. Now here's your word. You know he's there because you can feel him. You can feel him in an unfeeling way. Now we're coming to St. John Climacus. We see in an unseeing way. We know in an unknowing way. What he means is we don't know or see in the normal way that the soul normally knows and sees. We're in, we've gotten deeper than that, and we know it, we know it. Because, um, so you have to imagine, so um, the only way that you're going to come to this fear of God so that it is actually an operating principle, and not just an idea that you hold, however tightly you might hold it, but an operating principle, the only way you're going to fear God is if you feel God. You feel him in your, in, in your deep inner part. And so, um, here it is. It is sown, what is? The fear of God is sown in the heart like an actual seed is sown in the ground. You can't see it anymore when it's buried in the ground. And yet, here's where this analogy, I suggest, begins to break down. Because it's the... Uh, movement of my faith that is laying hold of that seed and burying it in the ground so that my faith is always holding that seed of God and I know it's there because I can feel it and he says it's sown in the heart so you notice he's saying it's not sown in the soul that doesn't mean that it's not in the soul. What he's saying is, it's going very, very deep into the heart, into the core. Um, this reminds me of, I can never, never remember the exact thing. I always have to look it up. Hebrews. The word of God is active. Uh, and, and, and it's active, and I think the word there is the same word that's used in Ephesians uh, for the the activity, the action of of Christ's holy resurrection. You know, the one that the the, the energy that is uh, working life and resurrection in the in the, in our in our heart that was dead. So the the word of God is living, and it is energetic. It's active. Um, it penetrates um, all the way to the division of bone and marrow, soul and spirit, to discern even the thoughts, you know, even the thoughts that are within this. It goes, so this, this, um, this, this, this fear of God is sown very deep all the way down into the heart that is darkened and dead in its sins and trespasses. And that, so that seed of God is sown in the heart all you know, it starts working its way down into the heart. How? When a man withdraws his mind 
Now, is he talking about the mind of, you know, the, the, the usual mind, <laughs> the ordinary mind of the soul? Or is he talking about this contemplative faculty of the heart? I can see how you would argue that he can't be talking about the contemplative faculty of the heart mm -hmm. because it has not been awakened yet. It's still lying there shriveled up like a corpse in the tomb of the heart. The noose has not yet been awakened. So um, it may be that he has in mind your ordinary mind. You know, the mind that you normally think with. So your ordinary consciousness. You could even say um, the mind that is the, uh, the organ of your... Uh, of which your ego is the organ. So your conscious mind. You could say your conscious mind. So take your conscious mind, your consciousness, take your e and, and its organ, the ego, uh, because, you know, you, you know you, there, there has to be an operator here. There has to be something here that is um, directing the mind to go this way or that way. And we call that operator that is making the choice to go this way or that way with itself, we call that the ego. Okay, that's the ego. The organ of consciousness, as it is called by uh, modern day psychology. Um, so withdraws his mind. So in other words, uh, you take you with your ego, with your, con with your sense of self, the con your conscious sense of self, you take your mind and you consciously withdraw it from the world's distraction. So as to confine its wandering thoughts within the contemplation of the judgment to come. And this is when, I mean, if we, this then would be when the fear of God begins to uh, root, uh, was, uh, germinate. This is when the fear of God begins to germinate deep in the heart. Now, put yourself in this. Imagine it if you can. Let's, let's, let's play it out. Um, under what motivation um, under what motivation would a person choose to undertake this interior work of laying hold of one's thoughts and subjecting them to the judgment that is to come, especially when that judgment is unseen. And there are many who would argue, who would, who would say, judgment, smudgment. There's no, there's no judgment. You know, eat, drink, be merry. It's unseen. Um, so what we're saying is that in this fear of God, or that one begins to fear God, because one begins to feel him, Begins to know him because one is feeling him. He's pressing upon one's inner man. Um, why then would you begin to fear uh, the judgment? I mean, I mean, think about it. Under what, under what um, circumstances, under what conditions would you begin to fear? The judgment that is to come. How would you, why would you even believe that there's a judgment to come? This is a deep question. This is a deep question. When I began to think about this, what I, what, 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 what I, what I saw was that when I go deep within myself and I'm, and I'm, and I'm well, in the first place, it's a, it presupposes that <clears throat> I'm going to start paying attention to my thoughts, right? I'm not going to be unconscious anymore of all these thoughts that are going through my head. I'm going to start paying attention to them. And um, I'm not going to allow myself anymore the luxury of just, you know, going through life and whatever thought is going through my head, that's what I'm going to think on for the moment. No, I'm going to pay attention to my thoughts and I'm going to begin to confine them. I'm not going to let them uh, take me here, take me there, take me wherever. I'm going to corral them. I'm going to direct them inward. And I'm going to begin to contemplate um, the judgment 
that is to come. Um, when, I f when I was thinking on this, and then as it were, doing this meditative contemplative exercise and going within myself, um, what I saw was that there is in my heart, what in my deep self, somewhere, there is an intuitive sense that, um, whatever you want to call it, life, reality, existence, has meaning. It has meaning. Can you feel it? I mean, I mean, I'm thinking, it's probably going to be hard to feel it here when we're distracted by everybody sitting around here. But when you're in yourself, when you're in your, when you're in your closet, and you go deep into yourself. Do you not sense deeply, profoundly, intuitively, um, meta-rationally, in other words, beyond, beyond reason, beyond discursive dialectical reasoning, do you not begin to feel that life has meaning? That flow, that the artesian spring underneath, underneath everything is this artesian spring of meaning. If things have meaning, let me see here, meaning doesn't meaning necessarily, doesn't necessarily imply justice. It might be hard, again, it might be hard to see this when we're distracted by everybody around us, but how can there, if there's meaning, that means that there's justice. Um, and if there's justice, it means that there's going to be a judgment. Um, and if there's, just, if there's a judgment, okay, now I begin to fear. Because the judgment is going to be what um, I'm accountable to for how I handled or engaged this stream of meaning that I live in. You following this, Dan? This is deep. I don't know what they mean. It says you're judged by your conscience. What's that part? No, I think the conscience is the intuitive sense of meaning. That's you know intuitively that that my life has meaning. And um, and. Um, the conscience is judged because it senses with this meaning that there's a justice to which it is accountable. Um, so now, here is when one begins to experience, not just as an academic idea, but as a real existential you know, um, experience, one begins to experience a certain trepidation, if you will, you know, a certain fear. Can fear be, fear uh, uh, brings up a picture in my mind. Is, it, is fear of God more like the righteousness of God, something that is there, absolute? Is, that is it something we just respond to it as fear of God, but it's actually as things really are, and we see, and we're, we're feeling that, and there's, there's something heavy in the conscience for it, and that fear of God is, is really just the righteousness of no, it's not the righteousness of God. Okay. It is the fear of God's righteousness. Yes, okay. Very good. <laughs> the fear of God's righteousness. Um, so anyway, what I'm... What, what, what the because judge or justice in our terms is different in the secular world. Yeah, it is. It, his justice is very different. This is absolute justice. Um, it's absolute justice. Um, where everything... Everything is going to be accounted for. Everything's going to be, you know, what's the word? Everything's going to be resolved in the right way. And now I begin to fear. Maybe to shake, to tremble within myself. Because I see this isn't a game. This isn't a game. Is it the unknown? I mean, that's your fear? Well, except that it's not so unknown anymore. It becomes more apparent. You're feeling it. You're feeling it. You're feeling it intuitively. You live in meaning. Yeah. That means you live according and against, you know, measured by the justice 
that measures the meaning. Life is not meaningless. Life is not a game. And when you begin to experience this, and that this is the point, this is not something you're thinking about. This is not an idea that you hold, that you mull over in your head. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know about that. No, this is a feeling. It goes, this is a feeling that is beyond feeling. This is something that <laughs> shakes you. Deep, deep, deep down inside. Now do you see the fear of God is beginning to germinate. So let's read it again. The fear of God is the beginning of virtue and it is said to be the offspring of faith. It. Okay, so the fear of God is sown in the heart through the activity, through the work of faith. And this is the work of faith. With drawing one's mind from the world's distractions so as to confine its wandering thoughts within the ruminations or within the contemplation of the judgment to come. Um, um, so, so, so faith is a movement or, and, 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 and it is an unsensory movement. I would, we need to break this off and get upstairs. So, so what, let's close with this. We now begin to see that faith is not only this work, it's, it's movement, um, but faith, faith is the work of listening. Deep listening. Not to, the, not to what's out there, but to what's in here. Rich. Humility, you start to experience humility. Actually, Richie, I think what we I think what we begin to see maybe is the outline of humility, and we begin to see how humble we're not. Yeah. We begin to see how we have lived not in humility, but in kind of a smug, self-satisfied, self-righteousness, thinking, oh, I'm okay, you're okay. You know, uh, nothing's wrong with me. I, I've been saved, you know. I've uh, got nothing to worry about. I'm okay, you know. And so they just go off. And, yeah, see, I'm saved. You're not. You want to be saved like me? You know? But in that humility, you realize you're a sinner. When you come into that humility. Or, uh, yeah, no, yeah. And it's like looking in the I don't know even yet that the humility is born. No, that's the greatest. You realize that you're a sinner precisely because you're not humble. And now you begin to crave humility. And you begin to discover that humility is a long way off. Why? It was something I've been contemplating. Listen, guys, we're from the dust. You know, we're made from the dust. So when I look at myself and I see the spirit that animates me, it is so contrary to the fact that I'm from the dust. It's a spirit of arrogance, conceit, vainglory, um, constantly judging everybody else as though I'm superior to them. It seems to me that if the spirit that was animating were consistent with the fact that I'm from the dust, it would be a spirit of absolute humility. I'm the dust. You're dust. There's no difference between us. I'm not better than you. You're not better than me. We're dust. So I see that spirit that's animating me that is so far away from the fact that I'm from the dust. And it makes me wonder, where did that spirit come from? It didn't come from the dust. And it didn't come from God. His God is living water. And water seeks the lowest point. So I'm from the dust and I'm made by God. I come from absolute humility. Why am I so far away from it? So faith, what else is the let's, let's conclude here. So faith is this deep interior listening. And through this deep interior listening of faith, one begins to feel in a way that is no longer intellectual, no longer ideological, but an existential sense that is beyond reason, beyond thinking, one begins to feel that life is meaning and that life is measured by a deep, profound justice. And this is the justice of God. And now I begin to tremble. Now I begin to fear. Okay.
we'll leave it there. We'll come back. So, um, I don't know. If you put your name on this, then you may keep it. But if you keep it, you've got to bring it back. You've got to bring it back. If you don't know that you can trust yourself to bring it back, then leave it with me.